I'm introducing myself, but um, I wanted to round out the session by talking about some lessons learned here at Washington University um, as it relates to a new training program that we've been building. And just to provide sort of sufficient context for my remarks, um, I've been here at Washington University for four years building a brand new Institute for Informatics that's designed to be cross-cutting uh, and not only operate across our School of Medicine, but across our entire university with our partner health systems and a variety of also corporate partners in the region. Um, and as part of that, I've had the opportunity to build training programs from a somewhat clean sheet of paper. Uh, so you're gonna hear a few remarks about that. So just to, again, the Institute for Informatics here really does cover the prototypical pillars that you would expect in an academic program. Uh, and I won't spend a lot of time on the specific details, but I'll draw your attention to the education pillar of what we do in this institute. And I'll say more about this in a few slides, but I think one of the important aspects of how we approach education and workforce development more broadly is to think across a pipeline model that begins all the way at K through 12 outreach and engagement and cultivates in supporting in-career learners, people who have advanced beyond prototypical graduate degrees or have other professional training. And I wanna spend a little time talking about some of our thinking about how to build competency-based curricula that support learners across this uh, full spectrum. One of the important things about the Institute, because it's not a traditional academic unit in terms of being a department, and I did spend 10 years uh, as a faculty member at The Ohio State University before I came here, uh, eight years as a department chair, so I have a little bit of comparative experience in this regard. But the Institute, as I alluded to earlier, is really built to be this cross-cutting entity, and we have a number of pillars you see illustrated here. but. Um, a number of those pillars I wanna draw your attention to very relevant to today's session is that not only do we have a set of centers focused on areas that you might expect in a academic informatics program, such as translational bioinformatics, clinical informatics, and population health informatics, but we also recently went through a process of bringing a previously freestanding division of biostatistics into the Institute to bring biostatistics and data science into the overall construct that I'm describing to you. And then importantly, we also have an important relationship with our health sciences library, positioning it as a digital hub uh, to enable outreach and engagement around many of the practical and knowledge-based uh, outcomes of our work. And cross-cutting in that institute are education and workforce development, core data and technology services, not to mention sort of the business operations that make all this uh, happen. And I want to sort of provide this framing at the outset because I think it's important when we think about how our biomedical informatics and data science educational programs truly operate as interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary training programs because of the very structure of the institute in which they are situated. So, uh, you heard me say a couple times that we label our training program as being a biomedical informatics and data science program, or BIDS for short. And part of that is based upon this conceptual model, uh, and this is a, a gratuitous citation of my own work, so I apologize in advance for that. Uh, but this model, which we think defines a very virtuous cycle between biomedical informatics and data science, and it's really focused on starting with understanding these biological, social, or technical processes in which a data information or knowledge uh, intervention may have benefit. And then moving through a cycle in which we're able to sort of observe and measure and collect relevant data and actually translate that into, uh, you know, really either computable or actionable knowledge. And this is sort of an afferent process, if you would forgive sort of the, the nomenclature. And then evaluate whether that be in sort of quantitative or more qualitative sense, including implementation science, organizational theory, human computer interaction, and the like, through a series of efferent processes until we then uh, inject those interventions back into the uh, environments in which they were originated from. And this is really where we see this critical interplay between informatics and data science throughout this entire cycle, right? This focus on not only gaining insights from uh, diverse and multi-scale biomedical data, but also using informatics theories and methods to inform the implementation and evaluation in these sort of driving biological, clinical, or population uh, problems. So our mission then is really to provide opportunities with trainees with diverse backgrounds to gain expertise across that entire cycle that I just described. This picture here I'm actually quite proud of. It's actually a picture from our uh, summer internship program. So in a period of about two years, we've established a summer internship program. They received somewhere on the order of around 200 applications for between 15 to 18 funded slots. 
And many of these students stay on and join our graduate programs. And we attract students not only from our own university, but throughout the entire state of Missouri and the surrounding area in the Midwest that are usually more advanced undergraduates, but we also attract, uh, in many cases, more senior high school students. And here you see a mixture of both faculty and uh, staff and trainees involved in that program from last year. I'd love to say that we'd have a picture like that this year, but we actually have converted this internship program into an entirely online internship. I'm actually quite excited. We're about halfway through the cycle and have had a tremendously uh, positive experience, uh, truth in lending, perhaps better than I expected for an all online internship program. So as I mentioned earlier, a pipeline model is sort of central to how we think about this program. And this is really our pipeline in the most simplified form. And I'll just start, I don't normally read my slides, but I want to emphasize when I talk about a pipeline here, I'm really talking about a sort of process or state of development and preparation production, really a system that starts all the way back with how do we get people excited and interested in informatics and then over time move them through sort of progressive or acute forms of education and workforce development. And I mentioned earlier that K through 12 outreach and uh, targeted undergraduate coursework is very important to us. I think very few people show up as undergraduates in major research intensive universities and say, I wanna be an informatician. They may not have even heard the word or I wanna be a data scientist. And they may be more likely to say they wanna be a data scientist but not even fully be aware of what that involves as being sort of a bi or transdisciplinary field. So we really work hard to reach out uh, to our local high schools in particular to provide summer research opportunities and experiential learning for those students to get them familiar, especially those that may be coming to Washington University or to some of the partner universities in the state that we work with. And then we also inject key undergraduate coursework with our colleagues in arts and sciences, engineering, business, and other key schools on our main undergraduate campus. I already described that we also have a high school and undergraduate summer research experience. That's where people that have expressed interest, usually because they've started interacting with us through this coursework, uh, then come through this competitive process and do summer rotations where they actually do work. Uh, they are expected to produce at least a conference paper or abstract by the end of that summer experience. And they also participate in a poster session that's open to the entire school medicine community. And our conversion rate of bringing those students into our training is really high, somewhere over about 20 to 30 percent depending on the stage and the educational life cycle that student's in. Then we have our graduate professional coursework, not to mention research rotations, and ultimately we're driving people towards either curricula, which are master's or graduate programs, or based curricula, both a PhD program and then a medical fellowship, much as Alex program at UCLA. Now, I mentioned earlier, another key aspect of what we do is focus on a competency-based curricular model. Uh, and what do I mean by that? So uh, our approach to coursework and experiential learning is that uh, we do not want people to walk away from the training programs with just a theoretical understanding of these principles. We want to introduce competency areas at a theory level, but then we want to have our trainees apply them in real-world lab or uh, actual applied scenarios and demonstrate mastery through synthesis and then evaluation of those experiential learning opportunities. So our metric for success is that someone can read a paper or answer a question in an exam or uh, perhaps uh, a project that's entirely in the classroom. Our metrics for success that we'd evaluate our program on are entirely based on mastery in the real world. Now, we believe that this produces trainees that are more uh, ready to succeed, whether that be in government, uh, industry, or academia, but it also requires a lot of training for our instructors because this is not how many of us were trained to actually deliver curricula. And there's lots of backstory to this around using flipped classroom, other sort of multimedia approaches to sort of remove the didactic component from our in-person learning and replace it with these experiential hand-on hands -on components. But I would point out this is an intentional behavior. Competency-based curricula are not something that happen uh, naturally based on the traditional traditional way that we often educate graduate students. And a big part of that is also how do we map those competencies to career pathways because not all our trainees are preparing for the same type of career. Some people are in fact training to be computational or data scientists to engage in original research, while others are training to be practitioners or strategic uh, leaders or you know to engage in sort of hands-on work in other settings. And so you really have to have what I describe as individualized educational plans. And I think a lot of the content I've heard from my fellow panelists sort of supports this conclusion uh, that there is not a one size fits all approach to training individuals 
groups because of the diverse backgrounds from which they come to our programs, but also because of the diverse endpoints to which they are training towards, right? So if we believe in the axiom of sort of designing with the end in mind, we need to put the competencies and the acuity with which they are introduced, right? So for example, uh, depending on the type of role you are going to have, you may need to have true foundational knowledge of the core theories and methods that you can apply in a novel manner to driving problems, where others may need to have more applied knowledge and understand sort of how those theories and methods are manifest in say an operational system like an EHR or a database or a system used to implement a biomolecular phenotyping uh, platform. And then others just need a culture race and need to be competencies that they can lead and understand teams that they are responsible for. So again, when we think about those individualized plans, we also focus on this issue of what is the acuity level which these competencies need to be both introduced and demonstrated. So these are just sort of a few screenshots of our core curriculum. We, as I mentioned earlier, we have practice-oriented uh, both graduate certificate and master's of science curriculum. Uh, it has both capstone and thesis options uh, and has multiple tracks. But one of the things I'll point out is we have really streamlined what one would consider to be sort of core curriculum in the form of both a survey and applications course and then the introduction of biomedical uh, data science and computation uh, such that we allow for a lot of time for advanced topics courses as well as electives based on those individual plans. So we really erred on the side of having a relatively lightweight core curriculum with a lot of latitude for advisors and advisory committees to work with individual trainees to implement this even at the master's level. And that's perhaps even more clear when you look at our PhD curriculum, which again effectively uses the same baseline coursework as what we see in our master's curriculum, but then stacks these additional opportunities for competencies and electives. I would also point out one class that I think is really important. I put an itali italics in this graphic, which is a course uh, that is labeled as acculturation in medicine. This is for our who are training for PhDs um, who do not have a clinical background. I think this is really important. Uh, and I will not claim having a come up with this on my own because this is something that happened in my own training as a fellow uh, at Columbia University earlier in my career. But this is a year-long series in which we partner our non-clinician trainees with clinician faculty and have them go through a series of both lectures, learn the core of medicine and pathophysiology, but have them spend time in the hospital and in ambulatory settings observing so that they understand the clinical context in which a lot of their work is taking place. And, and my argument, other than teach them not to touch anything that's on a blue drape, is also uh, to teach them how to not make inappropriate or perhaps ill-informed assumptions about the clinical applicability of their own work in the long range. And so I do think that's a really important dimension, and I believe that's a great uh, example where experiential learning is the only way to introduce this. You cannot teach this to non-clinicians without putting them into the clinical environment. So what have we learned so far building this new curriculum? We're four years into building this. We have students in all of those training uh, programs. Well, first is a competency-based curriculum require a lot of culture change and faculty support. This is not faculty, myself and it's not just about to get in front of a room hey, we're going to implement a competency-based curriculum. You really have to provide that instructional design support to your faculty. The second, and something that I feel very strongly about, is that especially in those classes where experiential learning is central to sort of the overall curriculum, that there's this magical combination that happens when you create pods of trainees. And very specifically, when we have multidisciplinary classes where we have pods that include people that understand the driving problems, such as clinicians or basic scientists, working on projects with people with a computational or mathematical statistical background, and then someone that comes from a more informatics perspective, whether because they had prior training or exposure. But often the most outcomes. And so I really think it's important to think about crafting these pods to gain these experiential learning opportunities. We've also learned that traditional disciplinary boundaries, labels, and norms are bringing people together to tackle this type of curriculum. You heard me use terms like to copy uh, in this presentation. And that's a part of 
important are the problems and using the right methods to solve them. And I think sometimes we get caught up in sort of labels and nomenclature at the expense of really getting to those practicable solutions. And I think our trainees are even less interested in those labels. So as much as we could go to an academic conference and debate ad nauseum uh, the various labels we would apply to these fields, what the students really want to know is, given this set of driving problems that I'm passionate about, how do I apply this full spectrum of computational data, informatics, uh, tools and methods to solve that problem. And that should be our core focus. Number four, and I've already said it multiple times, individualized educational program is absolutely essential to success. And I think we've heard that from multiple panelists. And then pipeline development. You know, getting the right trainees into these programs is absolutely essential. I don't have time to talk about today, but we actually have a very robust set of international outreach programs in China, India, and South America in for our outreach throughout the country to try to build a trainee uh, pipeline to actually fill all these different programs. So a few final thoughts. There's been tremendous evolution in our field in the last several decades from you know, paper record keeping in the lab or into the clinic to now precision healthcare platforms. But I would challenge us all to think, you know, are our educational and training programs positioned to evolve at a similar pace? And I would say, hey, you've got a snapshot of programs that are uh, poised to do that, but I'm not, it's universal. And I think it's a critical question. You know, do we consider these programs to be fixed in time and space or are they dynamic and in need just the environment in which they're situated. And I think, I think that they do in fact need to be dynamic. The second is I think we need to be very careful about sort of this artificial delineation between base and applied research. And people often think of them as being dichotomous and that's actually a function of many seminal reports by people like Van Bush and others. But I would argue if you have not read this book, Pastor's Quadrant, this is my plan for all of you, you have it very agreed. Um, and the takeaway is if you look at the work of highly scientists like Louis Pasteur, what he really engaged in was this idea of use of research, rapid translation of time between basic and applied science. And I believe that is really what we need to be training our future information and data scientists to be able to do. Not to engage in purely basic research or purely applied research, but to do both simultaneously in a highly agile manner. And then lastly, uh, I just want to make a point that when we build these training programs, as much as we want to train people to have strong theoretical and applied backgrounds, we should not lose uh, sight of what I think is a really important role, which is also the data translator. And this is a great article uh, from 2018, Harvard, if you haven't read it read it. You know, we all have these people on our teams, right? These are the people who help find the problem and understand how to interpret the outcomes of our projects. Um, these people don't have to be technical experts, but they are essential members of the team, and we need to support and develop their careers as well. And that's a lot of and in career focused graduate uh, programs become absolutely essential, and I think it's the thing that we all need to be cognizant of. So I'll end there. I know we're just at time. Uh, and if anyone has a question for me before we wrap up, uh, I am happy to answer that. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and assist sure. with the other questions as well, since we just yep. had a couple of from, yep. from Dr. Dean here. Uh, so I, I see one in the uh, in the chat box. Yes. Uh, like this from, from, from Pei Pei. Uh, yeah. She asks, uh, could, could you share with us what the keys to keep collaborative efforts as synergistic among many faculty members from such diverse disciplines? Uh, you mentioned faculty support. Uh, so how did you recruit and foster faculty support? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the, the real takeaway is that same magic combination that I described earlier for faculty, uh, for students, uh, exists at the faculty level as well. So I think a big part of what we do to support our faculty is play matchmaker to bring together those multidisciplinary teams and then provide them with the environments, whether those be sort of virtual or physical, to be able to work together effectively. Um, I think uh, the other key point is that trainees and programs like what we're talking about today are the lifeblood of interdisciplinary collaboration because sharing trainees between or across labs and research units is an incredibly effective way of uh, enabling sort of broader collaborative or team science approaches to these really difficult problems that we're trying to tackle, especially in precision medicine. And we had one from uh, Bradley Mallon as well, uh, who mentions that the T32 big data training programs are coming to a close and not going to be renewed. Uh, do you think we need to expand a, an existing program like a T15 or create a new T program through NIH to support this educational model? 
Yeah, so you know, Brad, it's interesting. When I was at oh, when I was at Ohio State, I actually had a T15, and then I had one of the data science supplements to the T15 that came out at the time, um, and I thought that was a very effective program to expand the scope of uh, what was available in terms of tracks. Um, I think that a lot of times we create artificial uh, sort of um, separations between training programs because of funding mechanisms. And in many ways, uh, these supplements that encourage interdisciplinary funding may be one of our best tools to sort of build those bridges. So I'm a big advocate for that personally. Um, and I wish I, I wish uh, we had more opportunities to pursue that. You know, at WashU, one of our biggest issues, you know, we have uh, an incredible volume of T32s and they're all very successful. The building bridges between those programs remains a, a very challenging endeavor just because of the sheer scale and uh, sort of uh, heterogeneous nature of those programs. I, I, I would just want to say that if you want to write a letter to the NIH or to the appropriate people at the NIH, I'd be more than happy to get on that with you because I don't think the C15 is sufficient to support data science. Yeah, I, I agree. So Brad, it sounds like homework for us. So. <laughs> Uh, Susan, Dr. Gregory, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Could you share with us your vision and the leadership that you've been thinking in that regard from the NIH data science perspective, training perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I'm more than happy to do so. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Excellent. Um, I think you're right. There was a lot of really great activity that happened as a result of the T32 big data training programs. Um, I got to know many folks in this community um, from those programs as well as the other big data programs, including the programs that I worked together with PayPay -Pay on. Um, and so those programs have been incredibly successful. We're now uh, looking at uh, what we can do in the intersection of training and artificial intelligence and biomedicine and biocomputing uh, as a part of the ABLE program, and certainly um, team-focused training that brings together data scientists uh, and potentially other types of scientists, mathematicians or computer scientists uh, heavily focused in AI with biomedical researchers or clinicians would be of great interest to NIH. It could be a large training center or it could be a large research center that has a training component. I think these are still to be determined. Listening to you and your talks, and thinking about team science and how we can move forward in a team environment would be of great value. When I was at NIGMS, I stood up a team science focused program. I, I, I've now forgotten the mechanism, RM1, I believe, which is an unusual mechanism that uh, brings together diverse scientists to focus on challenging, grand challenging research programs. Maybe something somewhat equivalent in the AI data science space that includes training activities um, or focuses on training activities would be relevant. I certainly would welcome your input as we move forward in this ABLE program. Uh, thank you, Susan. That's very exciting to hear. I, I would just note, so I, I hold an RM1 currently, and I, would, I wholeheartedly agree that this would be a fantastic mechanism to use and and we strongly encourage that. Thank you. So I, I wasn't want... sure if anyone would um, be on uh, this call that happened to be a recipient of the RM1 mechanism. I'm very glad to hear that it's a success for the research that you want to do. That is the goal is to enable you to do the kind of work that you really want to do. So I want to be cognizant of the time because I think we've gone right through our plan break. So I want to double check uh, whether or not we want to take uh, sort of a short break now, which I think, uh, Harry, you are proposing and then come back for the, the next session. Is that right? Yes, I, I think okay. uh, five, five minutes are certainly in five order. Minutes. We, okay. we invite everybody to come back after that, that quick break and participate in the panel. Well, before we break for five minutes, I just want to thank all the panelists. I thought this was a really great session. So thanks for 